Penance by Jerry Gurn. I'm outside taking in some icy fresh air when I see Captain Lawson hobbling towards me down the town's single muddy street. I curse under my breath. It's been two weeks since he appeared last, and I had just begun to hope that he was gone for good, that my time here was nearly over. He's in bad shape, but certainly not the worst I've seen him. He's limping. His face is scratched and pale, his fatigues damp and filthy. His shirt is buttoned all the way up, but he's still shivering. From the thickness of his stubble, I know that he was out there in the forest for two nights this time. But he's making his way toward me quickly. He always spots me long before I spot him. It's remarkable the distance from which he can discern my rumpled uniform, even when he comes to me after sunset. He has a pilot's perfect vision. As Lawson passes the local bar, the front door opens. The owner, a great heaving mound of beard and flannel, emerges onto the street. He sees Lawson, snorts, and gives a melodramatic salute. Lawson looks uncertain but returns the gesture as he passes. The barkeep brays with laughter and looks at me as if we've just shared an excellent joke. It always confuses Lawson when the locals seem to recognize him. Most of the 184 denizens of this town have seen him many times, shambling along in varying states of disarray and disrepair, asking to use their phone, ranting about needing to contact his operations center. They see his ragged fatigues and conclude that he's a war veteran who saw too much. Most are kind enough to just direct him to my recruitment center. They're always either amused or bemused that he never appears to remember them in the slightest. I confess, after so many years of this duty, even I can't get past expecting Lawson to remember me, perhaps to hesitate a little fearfully before he enters my office. Hello, my friend. I pretend not to notice his Air Force fatigues and greet him in the way a real recruiter would. How are you doing today? The man can barely stand, but he salutes smartly. I salute back. Technically, I no longer hold any rank, but I wear a captain's uniform. I was once a colonel. Captain, he croaks. My name is Captain Matthew Lawson. I'm on official Air Force business that I can't discuss, and I need to use your phone so I can reach my op center. Um, I see. I affect surprise as always. Well, come on inside. Jack, the old Eskimo who runs the general store across the street, spots crazy Captain Lawson through his front window. He shakes his head and smiles at me kindly over the stacks of propane bottles. Lawson limps up the wooden stairs to my storefront, wipes his muddy boots on the mat, and comes into my office. I smile back at Jack and close my door. I move quickly to my desk and look around for a moment, pretending to search for the phone handset, then to spot it atop the filing cabinet. As I reach towards the handset, I position myself so that Lawson can't see what I'm really reaching for. All right then, Captain, I say deliberately sounding a bit skeptical now. If you need to contact your ops center, I'm going to need you to tell me one thing. I turn and look him directly in the eye so that he will look into my eyes and not see the taser in my hand as I fire it at him. I use this small trick on him every time. The darts make contact. Lawson never utters a sound. His body stiffens and falls backward to the floor, twitching violently. He was barely standing when he arrived, and by the time I turn the taser off, he's unconscious. All the same, I grab the chloroform bottle from the filing cabinet and give him a thorough spray in the face, because I still have nightmares about the time he woke up briefly inside the shredder. I throw open the door to the back office. The shredder's gasoline engine is well muffled, and the air intake and exhaust are connected to hoses hanging out the window. I start the engine and open the hatch just as the rings of stainless steel teeth begin to spin. I pick up Lawson, carry him over, and feed him into the maw, arms first. Triangular teeth bite into him. I hear his fatigues and then his skin ripping. I feel his body jerk about, then I hear bones crack. Slowly his weight is taken from my shoulders, and then his dangling legs are pulled in. As soon as it is over, I hose off the teeth and gears and flush all the liquids into the septic line. I have to do this quickly without even taking a moment to catch my breath or calm my racing heart. As I work, I pray, as always, to whomever or whatever will answer, that this is the last time I will ever see Captain Matthew Lawson. I am not a murderer. The real Captain Matthew Lawson is a major now. He's been back in Nevada all this time while I've been out here doing undeserved penance. Let me tell you something. Every conspiracy theory you have ever heard is a lie. A lie designed and planted by the conspirators themselves to distract you from what they've really been doing. Lies cover secrets. Secrets are power. Power facilitates acquisition of secrets. 
Those who truly rule our world have used that cycle to make their collective position unassailable. If you are not born into their circles, you can only learn their secrets by becoming their devout servant, by pledging your life to them. I am a bearer and protector of secrets. Long ago, I coveted secrets of an entirely different sort. In gravitation and quantum mechanics, I saw glimmers of the ultimate cause of our universe. In pure mathematics, I saw shadows of the deep structure that underlies all of reality. Those secrets I pursued, forsaking all else, as devout and meditative as a monk. My work brought me accolades, but only faint glimpses of the knowledge I truly sought. My work also caught the attention of certain members of the secret echelons. They knew what I coveted, and they offered me a deal. I donned the uniform they required of me. I directed research projects for them. And when they were satisfied that I had no gods before them, they summoned me out to the desert. Within vast concentric rings of razor wire and snipers who never slept, inside a steel cavern a mile beneath ancient mountains, they switched on the floodlights and revealed their most precious secrets to me. Not all of their secrets, of course. They never told the scientists where all those strange artifacts had come from, or even how they had been acquired. Our purpose in the vault was to determine what those devices did and how they worked, and to make them work again. Three of the world's top physicists, all men of my caliber and all dead for years according to the public news, had labored for two years to understand just the power systems of the artifacts. By the time I arrived, they were able to activate the devices, nothing else. Under my direction, the team achieved a new synergy. We made breakthroughs. Precious secrets poured forth. Our masters were pleased. They promised us all the resources we could need, all the rewards we could desire, if only we kept the secrets coming. I cannot be blamed for what happened to Captain Lawson, even though I was. Everything we did in that lab was a risk. It took men of acknowledged genius to even guess the function of those machines. When you activate a device and observe what it does, that doesn't automatically tell you how it works or how to use it. We tested the teleporter over distances of inches, then yards, then miles. We tested with inanimate objects, then plants, then dogs, then test pilots. After dozens of tests, we believed we knew how to set it properly. To this day, I cannot say if the device was set incorrectly on Captain Lawson's final run, or if the damn thing was just broken. You can easily imagine the clenching of our stomachs when Captain Lawson left the Nevada base, but failed to appear at the Alaska site. Our jubilant relief when he called us two days later from a remote town just 30 miles off target. Our open-mouthed astonishment when he called us again four days later from that same town, while lying just down the hallway in our base infirmary. Under a cover story of a cargo plane laden with dangerous materials having crashed in the mountains, we quarantined 200 square miles for two months. While Captain Lawson No. 1 was being hastily moved to a different base, and while Captain Lawson No. 2 was puzzling over his rather chilly reception home, our troops fanned out and intercepted one by one Captain Lawson's No. 3 through No. 19. After two months, the need for some more discreet arrangement became apparent. The need for a scapegoat, I confess, was not immediately obvious to me. My superiors, it seemed, had superiors of their own to appease. I've never actually seen Captain Lawson materialize out there, but I can well imagine those first moments. He's nauseous and dizzy, and he finds himself in a hilly forest when he had expected an Air Force compound. He always appears within a few miles of where he appeared the first time. The nature of the teleportation process prevents materialization inside of a large mass like a mountain, but Lawson does sometimes appear a few feet above the ground, hence the broken legs and twisted ankles on which he often hobbles into town. He gathers that his teleportation went awry. He tries to activate his radio beacon and curses once he realizes the electronics are fried. Summer must be very confusing for him. He believes and will forever believe that it is January. He's supposed to be in Alaska. The place he's in looks like Alaska, but there's no snow. He has no idea that he's only off target by about 30 miles and many months. In winter and spring, he knows all too well that he's in Alaska somewhere deep in the wilderness. However injured and inadequately dressed for the cold he is, he knows he's on his own to find safety and a phone from which to contact the operations center and summon a rescue. He's strong and in peak physical health. Even so, he's died of exposure several times. Two of those times, locals found him before I did. 
Fortunately, if you run his prints, picture, or DNA through a police database, all you get is a notice that the FBI is on the way. But most of the time, Lawson just walks downhill until he finds the creek and follows it into town. The sloped terrain is most helpful, catching him wherever he happens to materialize and funneling him to me. Lawson follows days old boot tracks that he himself left and sleeped in hollows trees he'd been in many times before. I hike out sometimes to leave food near his usual dens, wrapped lunches that a careless hunter might have dropped. In winter I create abandoned campsites at which Lawson rejoices to find some old threadbare blankets. I do all I can to help him reach town quickly. By the time he does arrive, he's hypothermic, exhausted, and hungry. But he never asks anyone for food or any kind of help other than the use of a telephone. They no longer let him use it, of course, now that they know he's just a crazy vagrant. They never seem to notice that his dirty, torn fatigues don't wear very much as the years go by. But I've assured them that the poor man is harmless. I've told them to not let him bother them, just direct him to me. I have a place in the back of the office where he can sleep. What the shredder extrudes into the sturdy military-issue plastic bags contains no solid pieces larger than a finger bone. And disposing of 180 pounds of human mulch is not difficult when no one has any reason to search for a body. Captain Lawson's journey ends with a jeep ride at nightfall to the catfish lake. In winter, we go ice fishing. There is still something left in me that pities him. Every time he appears out there, he's starting anew while I've gained experience. I know what makes him suspicious and what he accepts without hesitation. He always makes the same decisions, and so he wanders unfailingly into a trap he'll never figure out. With each passing year, my penance task becomes easier, more monotonous. My superiors have promised that once my mess is cleaned up and Lawson stops appearing, I can return to their service as a scientist. And every time I pour a bag of him into the frigid lake and hear the dark water around me teeming with hungry mouths, hope rekindles in my heart. Lawson torments me with that hope. He always waits just long enough for me to taste my imminent freedom, then he reappears. And unlike me, he doesn't age or grow weary, he doesn't feel the years dragging by, and he doesn't have me inside his head, haunting him even in his sleep. In my nightmares, Lawson comes to my recruiting center already torn to pieces, shrieking in pain, telling everyone what I've done. Sometimes he screams from inside the shredder for hours, fighting the stainless steel teeth that can't seem to finish him off. Other times, thousands of him float to the surface of the lake, and I struggle in vain to push him back under before anyone on the shore sees. But the worst nightmares are the ones that imitate my waking life. Entire ragged mobs of vengeful Lawsons come shambling down from the moonlit forest for me. I try to flee, but my feet are frozen to the surface of the lake. When the Lawsons finally reach me and surround me, I discover that I can move my legs after all, but I don't flee. I'm no longer afraid, only relieved. I go into the darkness with them willingly, finally free. And then I realize that they've only taken me back to the recruiting center. I look down the town's single muddy street, and I see Captain Lawson in the distance, limping inexorably toward me. The End Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed Penance. So Penance is a story that I actually wrote a few years ago, and I submitted it to a Writer's Digest uh, short story competition in science fiction. They recategorized it as horror and gave me first place in horror. So that was a happy day, and apparently I am a horror writer. Um, so I know that the uh, uh, majority of my subscribers came over to my channel from Isaac Arthur's uh, channel, um, and so I wanted to start the channel with a couple of science fiction stories. The next story I post is going to be uh, on a different path. It's a supernatural tale, and it's also the shortest uh, short story that I've ever written. So um, that'll be as soon as possible. Um, it's taking me a little bit of time to do this because Isaac talked me into posting my stories on YouTube, and I had never posted a YouTube video, never owned a microphone, didn't know how to do sound editing, never photoshopped an image, and there's just a lot of little bits and pieces to learn. But I'm having fun. It's just taking time. Um, if you are eager to uh, read more of my writing, uh, the short story collection Purple Dreams and my novel No Moon to Pray To are both available on Amazon. And uh, in the meantime, if you like this story, uh, please like, uh, subscribe, notifications, bell, share, the, the whole deal, and uh, emphasis on the share if you have friends who uh, enjoy these kind of stories. I really appreciate that. Um, 
In the meantime, everybody have a great week and uh, watch out for Mysterious Ancient Relics.